so we have a number of concerns. Um, two of them are really top of mind at this moment. The first one uh, is around uh, intimidation itself, the issue of potential violence, uh, the issue of um, you know individuals and groups intimidating black voters at the polls. I think a lot of what we've heard over the last two weeks suggests that this is not um, uh, an irrational uh, concern and fear for us to have. Uh, and so we can expect that there are going to be a number of concerns about whether there has been voter suppression that happens in real time at the polls. And, fr and frankly, uh, as we've already started to see, early voting is in play for this as well. Uh, this may mean that there are real concerns on the back end of whether all voters in particular polling places were able to participate equally in the political process. Uh, the issue of militias and so forth will be taken up by one of our, our subsequent speakers, but they all fall into this bailiwick of intimidation. We should remember that intimidation is not just about independent militia groups. Um, it, we also have concerns, frankly, about state actors. Um, you heard the president talk about bringing out sheriffs and so forth. Uh, we're also on the lookout for that. There are a number of civil rights statutes that will help us on the back end, 42 U.S.C. 1983, uh, 42 U.S.C. 1985, that prevents against conspiracies to interfere with the right to vote. But those are, that, those are back end litigation uh, that will be available to us and that might form the basis for being able to challenge uh, election results that come in to particular polling places. So it's critical to be aware of that. The second big uh, bailiwick is around absentee voting. And that's because during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, many civil rights organizations have pushed to try to expand absentee voting opportunities uh, for Black voters. Uh, the Black community has been very hard hit, as you know, the Black and Latino community by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so a number of us, in including the Legal Defense Fund, have really uh, honed in on some of the onerous absentee voter require requirements in some states. We just uh, recently uh, won our litigation in Louisiana uh, three days ago, we received uh, a favorable decision in Alabama, which relaxes absentee voting, uh, voter restrictions. And what this means is that we are going to see something we generally don't see. So African-American voters are less likely traditionally to vote absentee. African-American voters often have mistrusted the absentee process, want to vote in person. It is part of a kind of a uh, an acknowledgement of history. Uh, and so traditionally, we have not wanted to vote absentee. It's also true that the votes of African-Americans who cast absentee votes are more often uh, not counted than those of white voters because of errors in how the absentee uh, vote was returned to the polls. But I think this year we're going to see something quite different because we have been encouraging uh, particularly elderly African-Americans who are more likely to come out to the polls traditionally to vote absentee to protect against COVID-19 pandemic. What that means then is that there's also the obligation on the back end to count all of those absentee votes. And so election night is one issue, but the week after election is going to be critical to count those votes, particularly in places where uh, African-American turnout is particularly important to the presidential election, to Senate elections, uh, and to other down-ballot races. 